Welcome. Thank you for joining the AC Spotlight Amazon Studios and tonight's conversation about time. I'm Anna Ogunkule, Marketing and Communication Consultant for the American Cinema Tech. Please visit our website, americancinematech.com, for information on our upcoming programs and how to support the American Cinema Tech by becoming a member or making a donation. I would like to thank Amazon Studios for making this conversation possible. Time is now streaming on Amazon Prime. Joining the conversation is director Garrett Bradley. The moderator is Beandria July, a film critic and member of the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. Enjoy. Well, um, welcome. I'm Beandria July. I am a film critic with the Los Angeles Film Critics Association, and I am here to speak with the wonderful writer director whose film you've just seen, Garrett Bradley's Time, um, which is one of the best films of 2021. Um, and uh, it's so great to speak with you, Garrett. Thanks for coming to this talk. Um, I wanted to, I really wanna get into the nitty gritty of the film, but I thought I would start off with a fun question, which is, you know, since we're, this is kind of a time capsule of a particular moment in time, both your film, but also like the world we're living in right now. Um, <laughs> I wonder if you could talk about like your pandemic um, viewing habits uh, and sort of what have you noticed yourself watching during this time um, or thinking about in terms of, of movies? Mm. Well, I hate to disappoint, but I think I've actually been um, taking this opportunity to um, kind of disengage to a certain extent um, from the two-dimensional space that we are so much a part of right now. I think, um, you know, there was a moment right when I think the pandemic became a real reality for us in the States where I really was so curious to see like, is this going to be the sort of great pause you know, is this going to be the moment where everything actually pauses and stops for a second and we can take a moment to reboot and re envision and imagine space and um, and uh, the way in which we live, the way in which we communicate, the way in which we go to work every day. Um, unfortunately, that has not happened, but I'm still um, fighting for it, I guess, in my own life. <laughs> so Great. I've been taking lots of long walks, actually, and, and, and reading books. Yeah. Great. That sounds enormously healthy. Um, and I mean, in terms of pandem pandemic cinema, you found yourself, you know, I'm sure <laughs> in the years of making this film, you never imagined the circumstance into which this film would emerge, right, when it premiered. Um, I actually got to see it. Uh, at Sundance at the first uh, at the premiere um, in the audience and you know I remember there were people crying all around me I was crying I'm not a person who usually cries during movies so it was really um, like a powerful moment that I, I won't forget um, and I wonder if you could talk about just what it's been like releasing this movie during this time yeah, you know, I think, unfortunately, I mean, incarceration has, is is uh, an extension of slavery, American slavery. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's ever been a moment I could look back on and say that the film would not be relevant. Uh, in you know, I mean, I hope the, there's potential for the future, you know, uh, and that's where my, my heart and mind um, rests. I think that what's, what stood out to me particularly again, kind of going back to the summer and looking at the protests that were happening, for instance, it was, I think, incredibly illuminating to me, um, the importance of imagery, the importance of optics around the prison and the industrial complex, because it is by design hard to see. Um, and it was even a, a sort of immediate challenge, even in the process of making the film to document Angola where Robert was incarcerated for 21 years. Um, so I think that that has been something that has revealed itself to me in the process of <clears throat> releasing the film in 2020 was how can we continue to think about the importance of seeing um, as a way of counteracting the systems, the oppressive systems that um, that are at the bedrock of our country. Right, right, yeah. And um, so you've all seen the film, you know, Fox Rich is this amazing um, woman who is the primary subject of this uh, film. And, um, you know, she's everybody's hero. Everyone should want to be like Fox because she's like an incredible human being. 
Um, and tell us about um, how the reaction to the movie that you've gotten over this um, season um, has been for Fox and Rich. Like, what have your conversations with them been like about the reception to the movie? I think we're, we're all just incredibly excited, but also more than anything, probably grateful that we have a platform where we can um, really try to build more attention towards um, what it means to be an incarcerated family. I mean, as, as I mentioned, the system itself is very difficult to see, you know, but it's hiding in plain, plain sight. And in many cases, the family um, and the way in which a family copes through the system is the only evidence of it. Um, and so I think we've just been incredibly grateful to be able to, to have a platform like Amazon that reaches millions of people to be able to share this story um, and to do it in a way that we think is um, innately human and about love. It's a love story, I think, first and foremost, um, and hopefully can, can offer hope and, and inspiration, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. So um, let's get the origin story. I know that this was intentionally meant to be a companion piece to your 2017 short alone, um, which also hit upon issues within the criminal justice system. And in that process, tell us you met Fox. So from picking up from there, tell us how um, the film originally came together. Yeah, I had, um, you know, when I was when I was making Alone, it was really important for me to think about how I could facilitate intergenerational conversations between women specifically who were in incarcerated relationships and families. Um, and I had contacted an organization called Flick, Friends and Families of Louisiana's Incarcerated Children. And um, Gina Womack, who's the co-founder and director of that organization, picked up the phone and said, the first person that you need to speak with is Fox Rich. And so Fox is briefly in alone, as you mentioned, and um, it's her and Lon in dialogue with one another. And Fox makes a really vivid um, connection between slavery and the prison industrial complex. Um, and I'd gotten to know her, you know, in the process of making that film. I think she and I were able to develop trust between one another. She was also able to see how that film then went out into the world. Um, which I think, you know, thinking about it from the other side, you know, of not being a filmmaker, but being sort of the central figure in a film, there's, there's, so, there's so much that you don't know. You don't know really that even as a filmmaker, you don't know where it's going to go, how it's going to be received, right? And I think her being able to, and the family being able to maybe see how that had happened with Alone, again, helped to sort of um, develop a foundation for us. Um, and I think for me personally, I was really invested in this idea of not allowing the short film to represent or be a sort of monolithic experience for how families navigate the system. Fox, you know, was at that point, Robert had been incarcerated, I think, 18 years. Um, and so for me, it was like, what would it mean to make a sister film, a sort of coupling film, that was essentially looking at the decision 18 years into the process of what um, alone, you know, was, was grappling with. Um, you know, and, and, and in such a different way and in a unique way um, as individuals, you know, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So from the time you met uh, Fox in like 2015, 20, you met Fox in 2015, 2016? Yeah, about that. It's a bit hazy at this point, but I think, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, yeah. okay. And so um, tell the folks about how the archival footage of the family growing up came to be part of the film. Yeah, that was, um, well, I mean, I I thought I was making, and as I said, another sister film, another 13 minute short film. Um, and on our last day of filming, um, I remember it being evening time and Fox was actually on the phone with Robert and she handed me this bag of a uh, little black bag of uh, what ended up being about a hundred hours of her personal home archive. Mm -hmm. um, and this was what I thought was our last day of, of shooting. You know, I mean, when you're making a documentary, there's so many factors that um, affect how long you can film when you need to stop. Um, and you really never know, of course, what the ending is going to be or, or there, there's, you have such little control. Um, and so I had sort of in my mind thought I was going off to finish this short film to start to start editing it. And when um, when she presented me with all of this material, it, it was uh, it was very obvious that I needed to completely rethink what I was making uh, with Gabe Rhodes, our editor, um, and how it was going to exist in the world. And and ultimately, 
that wasn't going to be different than the intention of why I was making the film, but um, the way in which it was structured and the way in which it would exist would would drastically change. <laughs> it would have to change, mm -hmm. yeah, for the better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I there's so much to to talk about with this film, but just bridging from there. Um, I know in the past with your films, you've been the editor, the primary editor, and this time you worked with Gabriel Rhodes, um, who's now an award-winning editor for this film, as mm -hmm. are you for um, three times over, I believe. You've won best film already. Um, so congratulations, obviously well-deserved. <laughs> um, so talk about your process with your editor, especially because of how important the interplay between the present day footage and the archival footage was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I there's so much that I can say about what it what possibility what challenges and possibilities present themselves when you're working with archive. Um, there's something kind of inherently interesting to me about thinking about archive, something that you yourself have not shot that you were not even privy to, right? Thinking of that as something that isn't fixed, but that is actually flexible, you know, um, and something that can be shaped within these broader contexts. Um, and so that was kind of ultimately the challenge. And it was in, in a more practical level, it was like, well, when, do, when are we in the archive? When are we not in the archive, right? Um, and I think it kind of boiled down to the very first conversation that I had with Fox and the family around why they wanted to make this film with me, right? And why did I wanna make this film with them? How could we um, get on the same page unequivocally about our intentions in making this? And the, our intentions luckily were in alignment. And that was that their story was the story of 2.3 million American families, that their story could maybe offer hope. And so my job then was to sort of distill this idea of hope, which can be kind of abstract and say, well, what does hope look like for the family on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And, um, and it kind of boiled down to three things. It was love, certainly, um, their love for each other, their love for themselves as individuals. It was their individualism, their ability to uh, follow their own unique dreams um, as members of the family and in the world amidst a system that intends to sometimes take one's individualism from them. Um, and it was also unity, their ability to stay together over the course of 21 years. And so when we were in the editing room and we were trying to create the parameters for how we were going to edit the film with the archive, it actually become a very, became a very simple formula of selecting only the images that spoke to those three pillars. Um, and I'd like to think that you could watch the film and there wouldn't be a frame that didn't express those three things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think intention is such an important part of the process, particularly when you're making documentary films, it, it becomes the bedrock and the blueprint of the work. Right, yeah. So yeah, I um, that reminds me of a question I was gonna ask about because the film is, I think, 83 minutes, a uh, little less than 90 minutes. Um, and given that you had 100 hours of this like amazing footage, plus all the footage that you captured, uh, I thought that was quite an achievement because, you know, it could have easily been two hours, I'm sure. And having that as your principle for the edit of does it fall, does it reflect these three um, emotions? It makes sense to me now how tight the edit is. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I definitely think that's reflected. I mean, I've, I've seen this film a number of times now and I hadn't seen it in a while. I just finished watching before we started speaking today. and. Um, it's really a love story, you know? I don't think that, even though the still of the film is Fox and Rob kissing and it's very obvious that, you know, love is a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it hit me in a different way today of this is a story about, you know, black love and um, not only between Fox and, and Robert, but the familial love of a black family um, and, I guess because I've been doing a lot of research about sort of the historical systemic um, ways that the system has sort of um, created so many roadblocks for black families like dating back to slavery and you know now through the prison industrial complex um, and so I wonder if you could just talk about um, did you kind of know that from the beginning like oh this is a love story or mm -hmm. how did it evolve for you? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, 
It is 100%. It is, it is a film that celebrates black, black love and black joy, you know? And I think that um, we learn about the, the system, we learn about the history of our country within the context of those things. But it was important for me that this film be food for us, that it also be something that, that we can watch without, um, that celebrates our resilience, our, our everyday resilience amidst the system. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, when I'm going into making a film, as I said, you know, there's intentions that, I'm, that are very clear to me. There's reasons why I wanna make the film. Um, that stay with me the whole time. But I think, why do I even get into wanting to make a film? For me, it always comes from loving a person, seeing their inner beauty, respecting them, wanting to celebrate them, you know? Um, and I think the beautiful thing about Fox is that you cannot separate her from her family. Um, she is her family, her family is her. Um, and so I think certainly it was a love story, but it was also um, a family story. You know, it's it's about being an American family, actually, in many ways. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I love. There's so many interesting characters. Of course, we know these are full fledged human beings with complex inner lives. But in terms of speaking about the film, um, I really came away loving Miss Peggy um, Fox's mother. Um, mainly because she felt so familiar to me and I loved how nuanced her and clear her understanding was of how the system works. Like, you know, there's a scene um, for folks who may not remember, it's like where she talks about the strategy she told um, Fox to use when she went into court and, and she didn't do that. And so um, she attributed that to why um, Fox got the sentence that she got and why Robert got the sentence that he got because he didn't take the plea. Um, and I think there's a lot of conversation. I actually, I wanna, I, I wanna actually read you this um, response from somebody who saw the film because I think it, it encapsulates the sort of like, do the crime, do the time uh, crowd. Um, <laughs> and, um, it's, you know, that's the thing about being on Amazon, right? Like it's a huge profile, it's a huge platform. Um, and a lot of different people are seeing this film, like yeah. who may not have missed, necessarily gone to see it in a theater um, in yeah. a different um, space. But um, they're talking about, you know, um, I believe people deserve second chances, especially first time offenders with no prior criminal history. And there's a lot of people on here who are saying quite the different, the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered if you could just speak to that um, about sort of why it was important for you to be honest about the fact that they did do the crime, but also um, have compassion for them. Yeah, I mean, it's not a film that's trying to build a case for innocence. And I think that it's important, you know, when you think about the magnitude, the amount of people that are, there's 2.3 million people that are incarcerated in our country. Um, and the one person that is, um, that is incarcerated is not the only person that is affected. Everyone that is in that person's life then is also serving time on the outside. So that's if not double, triple, quadruple that number. That's a huge percentage of our population um, that don't have access to their loved ones. Um, and I think it's more about how do we think, how do we elicit um, compassion, not on the basis of innocent or guilty, but in really trying to evaluate the cost of time, you know? Is it really, is the sentence, does it actually match the crime? You know, do those two things actually equate one another? Um, and, you know, 21 years of a person's life of all of all six of their sons growing up, all of those memories that are lost, um, especially in a system that is not focused on rehabilitation. Um, I think that it was important for me to to emphasize that um, that love is actually the thing that changes people, and it's the thing that is that is going to change our world. Um, and so it's not really about the crime; it's more about the effects. Um, that this has on families, right? The effects of the facts. That is the only entry point that we, um, that, is, that is the only way in which I think we are going to be able to have compassion for one another and to change our world, is to have vivid examples of what that looks like and what those effects are. Mm -hmm. um, so that was incredibly important to me every step of the way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I mean, if we're only going to have compassion for people who didn't do the crime, then that's not going to solve, you know, the systemic problems that led people to make, do crimes in the first place, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, I thought when she says desperate people do desperate things, I felt like for me that really, you know, it's like they were in their 20s. We remember what we were like, you know, exactly. when we were first starting out. I mean, did you make all the right decisions? Did you know right. all the information? Um, so, um, and I think just looking at the prison system more largely, like if we're only going to forgive people who are innocent, then we're not going to dismantle the system, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really actually love that you focus on that because I think a lot of documentaries in another person's hands, um, you know, could have looked really different. Um, <laughs> and um, I wanted to circle back. Well, that actually brings up a question about sort of who's watching this film. Mm -hmm. um, when I was at the premiere, I remember when Miss Peggy said she thought Fox was going to marry like a doctor or an Indian chief. Mm -hmm there was like laughter from the people around me when Indian chief came because they didn't know about the history of New Orleans and how important that is to folks there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot about the film that unless you know New Orleans, it's not going to necessarily stand out to you. And I kind of loved you encode these little secret um, bits of NOLA in it. And I wonder if you've talked to people from audiences, viewers from New Orleans who've, um, seen the film and what their reactions have been. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, certainly, I mean, I, the response that we've gotten, you know, some of the most kind of gratifying and touching responses that we've gotten have been from people in the world who are either directly affected uh, in the same way or know somebody who who is, or also had no idea, you know, um, that incarceration was a, was a, was a problem. Um, and I think that like in Louisiana, so many of us are affected by incarceration that um, it's been really, um, it's been really gratifying to know that we're reaching people in a way that they also want to see themselves, you know, in a way that they feel um, honors the complexity of what it means to be in an incarcerated family um, in the South. Um, and so, you know, I mean, when you put a film out into the world, there's, you have critics, you have, and then you have culture, you know, and it's a really beautiful thing when you're able to, to reach both. And, and that in many ways, I think is the success of even having a sort of integrated response um, to what you put out into the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you know, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I wanted to, I was also in rewatching this one today, the music also hit me in a different kind of way because it sort of starts out, um, isn't the right word, but sort of like va vaudevillian or evoking like a, a before time, um, a past time. And then it sort of leans into something I might call more ethereal as the film progresses, um, more resembling like quote unquote normal score. Mm -hmm. um, that we're used to seeing in films. And I, it was really, um, it just fit so well. And you kind of leaned, I thought pretty heavily into the score, but it, it made sense for the film. And I wonder if you could talk about how you, you put the score together, how you thought about it. Yeah, I was, I mean, it's funny because I try, I try to develop the, the visual language for a film, even when I'm in the research phase. Um, and with this film, I actually had a really difficult time hearing it. <laughs> um, and it was this, there were so many sort of cosmic moments every step of the way in making this film that I never could have anticipated. And the music was certainly one of them where I just, Emma Hoy's music popped up on, on my YouTube uh, account as just the algorithm just suggested it. Uh, Emma Hoy, for those who don't know, she's a, she's a 96 year old Ethiopian nun. She's still alive. Um, she came from a wealthy family and was then a prisoner of war and was a child prodigy, um, was trained in Western classical Western music um, and decided to go back to Ethiopia uh, and recorded this, had this, she's only done one recording which was done in 1963 of all years uh, to raise money for an orphanage. Um, and so I, not only did I love the music the minute I heard it, I think what, what really kind of solidified things for me was the prospect of being able to bring these two women together in space and time with the film. 
Um, and I really wanted it to feel like a river, you know, I wanted it to flow because so much of what we're doing visually is hopping around quite a bit from one stone to the next. And we needed um, something to kind of, uh, something linear to sort of counteract um, the lack of linearity that we're doing with the structure of the film itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely had this super grounding effect, but also mm -hmm. kind of made you feel like, I mean, let's just talk about time, you know, both the title and the, the yeah. thing. Um, it's, it's not lost to me that we're in this period of, you know, human existence where time sort of has no meaning or is sort of, we're experiencing it in a different way. Um, we're losing track of time where, um, you know, a year has gone by almost since the pandemic hit, but it also feels like it went by very quickly, but also extremely slowly at the same time. And um, uh, tell us about why you landed on the, the title of time. Well, you know, naming things is probably, the, <laughs> for me, it's the most difficult part of making a film, to be honest yeah. with you, yeah. um, because it's so definitive. Um, and I think, you know, we, I remember when we were shooting, it, it became really important for me to try to do some, uh, to really get a sense from Fox and from everybody in the family on what time means to them personally, mm -hmm. because time certainly was the overarching theme. And I think by the time, I mean, Fox talks about this, uh, you know, it really vividly that by the time we had started filming, she was really kind of at, at on an edge. You know, she was in terms of the, really, really feeling, I think her patience uh, for lack of better phrasing was really running out, you know, with the bureaucracy, with the system, with the lack of clarity. And so time and the clock were things that I think were constantly in our mind, you know? Um, and, I, and what's interesting is that also the word time doesn't in my mind elicit any kind of image, right? And, and, and the, when, we, when you do think about a clock, a clock is often time connected to you know, imperialism to the weaponry of time, to imposing um, being late or being on time. It was brought to India in the 1860s, right? And there was an entire revolt in India where they tore that clock down in the 1890s as a, as a response to um, controlling people with the clock, right? So there, there is a lineage and there is, a, there is something that's trackable. There is context for how we understand human labor and the enslavement of people and the prison system with, with this abstract idea of time and with clocks. Um, so for me, it was, it felt intuitive in the sense that it was broad, um, but time is also something that we are playing with in a, in, a, in a physical way with the structuring and arrangement of the film itself. Also with the way in which hopefully viewers are experiencing uh, real time with Fox throughout the course of the film. Um, so, I, you know, ultimately I, I ended up going for it because uh, it kept it open and, um, and, and kept a lot of different uh, possibilities and sort of ruminations for, for what that can look like and what it means within the narrative of the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it fits with your, your body of work of, you know, your film America, your um, <laughs> film Alone, you know. It, it's like, it's, it's sort of, um, I like how you take space to leave space for the abstraction and the complexity of it, because you don't often see that right, um, in, in this kind of like prison film, you know, you can see the title being something completely different and much more sort of typical. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think it works really well. Um, I, and speaking of your other work, um, I know that this fall you had your first solo show as, a, as an artist, as a fine artist um, with uh, the MoMA in New York and the Studio Museum, Thelma Golden. Yes. Um, tell us about that. Uh, I mean, it's, it, I'm still pinching myself to be honest with you. Um, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was a sort of particularly um, meaningful moment to have these two institutions uh, working together to kind of realize that particular work um, because it, it really hearkened to the impetus for me of wanting to make America, which was to sort of honor an integrated effort toward a black vision uh, in 1913 with Burt Williams. Um, and thinking about, you know, for me, it also being the first opportunity in which I could work and experiment with physical space. You know, I think as a filmmaker, 
there are a lot of exciting challenges of what it means to tell stories that are whole, that are holistic, that are 360 degrees within the confines of two-dimensional space where you're only able to tell stories one frame at a time. So for me, it's been incredibly gratifying to be able to kind of dip my toe into expanding um, the tools of cinema and of storytelling um, that are not confined to a screen, uh, but that are things people can move through and experience. Uh, and also I think even further understand the interconnectedness of all tenses of time that, that, that the past and the present and the future um, are, are cannot be separated from one another. Um, and so I've just been, I was incredibly grateful to be able to work uh, with a legend like Thelma Golden uh, and with the entire curatorial team between uh, both institutions. Um, and that it's also in a space that's free, you know, that anybody can walk into that building through March and, and see the work. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for it. Yes, yes. If you happen to be on the East Coast, uh, you know, those of us who can't travel right now are very sad that we can't go see it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, and you know, a lot of times in, particularly in Hollywood, you know, sort of when it rains, it pours. Mm -hmm. And this is, I imagine has been quite, you know, a year almost or two for you um, in sort of presenting this film, having your solo show, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, what has it been like recently during award season? I know you've you you've won best your film has won best movie three times for the I the LA Film Film Critics Association um, and the New York um, Film Critics Circle and then just recently the Gotham Awards as well as your editor has won awards as well. Um, what's that been like working on this film for so many years and then having it come out in a pandemic and then it being so well received? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, for me, it goes back to intention of why I wanted to make the film, why we wanted to make the film. And it's incredibly gratifying to see that that intention is, uh, ha was not only realized, <laughs> like the film was made, um, but that uh, the heart of it also speaks to the hearts of other people outside of just us as the makers of it. Um, so that's been really incredible to see. And it's, it's my first feature length documentary film. So I'm, I'm, learning as I'm going through the process um, and really just in a place of gratitude. <laughs> like I just, I feel incredibly grateful that um, I was offered an opportunity to make a film on my terms um, with, uh, with incredible collaborators and, um, and that it's on a platform that, that millions of people can see. I, you know, I, I, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm emotional almost. It's, it's beautiful. And we feel, we all feel like just incredibly lucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what's, what are you hoping to work on in the future? I, I read that you have a, a Naomi Osaka documentary from Netflix that's forthcoming. And um, I know you did some work on Queen Sugar and um, When They See Us, Ava DuVernay's work. Um, mm -hmm. What are you, um, looking forward to uh, around your future work? Well, I think that there are, I think generally speaking, I'm, I remain really invested and interested in this idea of the truth and this idea of justice and how those two really broad ideas uh, exist in, uh, you know, between people, between communities, between ideas. I think that there are some sort of overarching principles that I will, will certainly remain um, invested in, um, what genre those end up manifesting in. Um, I'm totally open. And I think I'm, I'm really trying to just be, to honor the present moment, you know, in the same way that I think COVID is, is, we're not even just COVID, but just the entire universe right now, every element of it, I, in my mind is really forcing us to, to pause and to be present and to, to create change, um, within that. And so I'm, I'm trying really hard to, to do that and to honor, honor the release of the film and to be present for it and um, and to be excited for the future when the future comes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, just wrapping up here um, in this whole process from like, you know, when you first had the idea for the film to, to and everything that's happened since, um, are you seeing the film now sort of differently um, than, are you, are there any new insights that are coming to you now, having 
been through what you've been through with the film um, and sort of what you're taking away from it as the mm -hmm. creator? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think again, that the biggest takeaway for me has been as an artist and as a, as a image maker, you know, thinking about the responsibility that I have with the images that I'm that I'm putting into the world and um, those images that will last longer than myself or or anybody who's in them and how that not only defines a present moment but also offers possibility for the future. And so I think when we are when we're thinking about love, when we're thinking about black love and black joy, when we think about systemic issues and the history of our country and the systems that oppress us, um, what's needed, you know, and what is the role of visibility in all of that? That's something that um, that I'm that that this project has has pointedly brought me to, and I'm continuing to to work towards. Great. Well, congratulations again. Um, Thank you <laughs> for Thank making you. the book. Um, Thank you. I uh, wish you luck this award season and in the future. I so appreciate your questions and your time. So thank you. Welcome.